my simple observation is that elite endurance athletes, they eat everything. They, they just do. You can succeed as an endurance athlete eliminating a food group or two, but you're just making it harder for yourself. And why would you do that? <laughs> This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who has been to Disney over a dozen times, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Thank you so much for joining me for the Running For Real podcast. I can barely believe this is here right now. I've been so excited about this and it's finally here. Whether you are a former or current Run To The Top listener, you are a new listener or you have just found me randomly somewhere, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen today. I really appreciate it and I look forward to getting to know you more. So I am releasing four episodes today. The first one was a solo episode for those people who do not know me. So if you haven't ever heard of me before and you're like, who is this girl? Make sure you go back and check that one out. I also do have uh, James Dunn and Sindra Kampoff as my other two episodes that I released today. I wanted to give you four in one go. Now, today I'm going to start the interviews with someone I know you all like and trust, and probably a lot of you do already know and like and trust uh, him. And Matt Fitzgerald is just so easy to listen to. That's one of the reasons I wanted him on here as my second episode. He is a best-selling author, including my favorite book, How Bad Do You Want It? In addition to other books on racing weight, on diet cults, he's done cookbooks. I mean, Matt has done all kinds of books, and they're all really, really good reads. He has so much good advice. And the thing I love the most about him is he's just so realistic with his advice. There's not all this science mumbo jumbo where he's trying to like show how smart he is. He really makes it realistic and he just makes it fun. And I don't know, I I think you're going to really like his new book, The Endurance Diet. So he's also talking about his new project, which is called Life is a Marathon. And he will share all the details about that today. But before we get on with the interview, I just want to ask you a favor. I have been working so hard on getting this Running For Real podcast ready, getting the business launched, and I'm not really asking for anything right now other than this favor for you. And I was hoping that you would either share this with your friends and family or running groups or whatever, especially if you are a former, or no, they are former Run To The Top listeners. That would be so helpful for me to try and get buzz and get get the name out there, get the word out there. Because you guys, if you're listening to this right now, you are in the same kind of position as I am. You're thinking about running and how we can actually be honest with one another and just learn and support from one another. The other way you can do me a massive favor is by leaving me a review on iTunes, which you can do by going to tinamuir.com forward slash iTunes. And I'll explain exactly how to do that. You know, I've worked really hard on these episodes and the best way you can support me and create some buzz is by leaving a review on iTunes that shows iTunes that I'm doing the right thing and it will help me move up the rankings. So thank you so much for it in advance and let's get on. It is time to meet Matt Fitzgerald. Hello, Matt Fitzgerald. I am so excited that you are episode number two of the Running For Real podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. I am even more excited. Thank you for having me. Actually, I am more excited. So um, <laughs> you can't win that one. No, <laughs> that's that runner, runner um, competitiveness taken over there. Um, so many people probably already know you, maybe through your multiple podcasts for the Run to the Top podcast, or maybe just through the every single channel and place you seem to be. And you just seem to be one of those people that just everyone looks up to and wants to learn from. But for those who don't know you, um, I wanted to start with kind of a, a fun fact, a hidden talent or something unique that people may not know outside of what you've done. I hope that most people don't know that my first book, my very first book was actually a book of poetry. Wow, interesting. Can you remember any of them off off the top of your head that you can share? Uh, you know what? So, so the, they were, I wrote kind of humorous verse and okay. a lot of it, a lot of material is kind of ribald and scatological and the, the, 
the things I might be able to quote, uh, you would have to bleep out some stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, then maybe we'll save that for another day. But for now, thank you for sharing. That's that's really cool. (laughs) Um, Okay. And then, so like I said, um, most of our listeners probably know of you. Um, You are a writer. um, You are an author. You've, um, you know, covered so many different topics within the running world, just an expert all over. But um, your latest book, um, The Endurance Diet, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and what prompted you to write this book. Right. So one of the hats I wear is uh, uh, sports nutrition. So I'm, I'm kind of in the business of trying to help runners and other endurance athletes perform better and just have a better uh, experience in the sport through better nutrition. And as anyone listening to this knows, there are a lot of opinions out there mm-hmm. about how to eat. And one of the challenges I always face is, you know, people getting contrary advice from other sources. Oh, yeah. Obviously, I like everyone else. I, I believe that I'm, I'm providing the best information. So, you know, I, I've thought about, well, how do I how do I kind of get through the noise and reach people and get them to you know buy into what I'm offering? Because I know if they buy in, they'll, they'll get results. And that, that's really what led to the approach I took with the endurance diet, which is sort of the step away from science a little bit, because science, or at least pseudoscience, can be used to promote any crazy kind of diet. Mm-hmm. You know, scientific literacy is just, you know, runners tend to be average in that regard, and they can't always tell the difference between a good and a bad scientific argument. And so in the endurance diet, what I did is I... I even re- regardless, I mean, I have a lot of respect for science, but with everything, when I'm giving training advice psychological guidance or, or nutrition advice, whatever, I look to the elites, people like you, because you can't perform at the highest level without pretty much doing almost everything right, especially mm-hmm. when you see common patterns, things that almost everyone at the highest level is doing. It's like, you know, monkey see, monkey do. Why not just do that? Regardless of what a study might, might or might not, might not say about these practices, why not do what the, the race winners are doing? So that's what I wanted to do with the endurance diet. So I I embarked on this big research project, which, if nothing else, was a fantastic excuse to travel. <laughs> and I went, I went all over the world and just got a seat at the table with uh, the world's greatest endurance athletes in, in a variety of disciplines. It wasn't just running. It was everything from stand-up paddleboarding to cross-country skiing and, and, of course, the big ones like triathlon and cycling and, and, and running. Um, and I just looked for patterns, just like are there, are there things – because that's been done in a scientific way, in a rigorous, more – technical way with training. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to see if it was also the case in, in, uh, with nutrition too, because that's incredibly valuable information. If those patterns exist, then they're very much worth emulating, even if you're just, you know, a recreational athlete. Mm-hmm. So that's what the endurance diet is all about. Yeah. And then, so you came up with the five core habits. Maybe we can explain which of those are in a minute, but, um, did you kind of go into this expecting those to be the five? Like, did you kind of have them in the back of your mind and you were kind of just seeing if they were like hypothesizing whether they were correct or not, or was it, you know, one or two of them kind of came up and you were like, huh, I didn't quite expect that. Yeah, I, I certainly had some idea what I would find because I wasn't starting cold yeah, here. That's you know, right. I, I've I've been studying or you know looking at paying attention to the diets of elite endurance athletes since the mid 1990s, and that's that's actually also part of the reason I wrote this book because I did believe those patterns existed. I okay. saw things coming up again and again. So it would have been a nasty surprise if everyone was doing something different and I had no book. <laughs> so <laughs> that wasn't a risk I would be willing to take. At the same time. I didn't want to just sort of check the box uh, yeah. and and not be surprised by anything, or at least you know get more detail and, and fill in some gaps. And so there there was definitely a fair amount of that where you know you don't really I, I find as a writer you you really don't know something until you try to write about it. So you have you have an idea in your head, but when you actually try to kind of work it out on on paper or on a computer screen, you realize you haven't thought it through mm-hmm. it, at all. And you know the same thing with the research element until you go and do it you know, you realize your, your ideas lack nuance. Foucault said, I would never want to write a book that didn't change my mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there you go. No, that makes sense. And, and, you know, the fir- the first one you mentioned, which was to eat everything, which I was so glad to hear because, you know, there's so many, there's so many people out there who kind of recommend that or, or, or end up trying, you know, to 
to cut foods out. And I've done it before myself. I mean, everyone knows that I'm a big sweets person, but you know, and I loved that the first time I interviewed you, you said you had, I remember this so clearly, you said, <laughs> I have, I have a bowl of cereal almost every day because I like cereal. And I was like, oh my God, he's telling us to eat cereal. Because like, there's so many people that say you shouldn't eat this, you shouldn't eat that. But you kind of, in the book, I loved that you straight away were like, no, like nothing is, is off limits. Not even like, you know, fried food food like you can have that from time to time so maybe explain a bit about that for people who think there are bad foods and good foods my simple observation in you know sitting down with elite endurance athletes is that they eat everything they they just do you know i i know that there are vegan elite endurance athletes mm-hmm. but i actually didn't encounter one and mm-hmm. i had scores of athletes you know I, I traveled to a bunch of places but i also collected information because i couldn't travel everywhere and so i you know, i got pretty detailed information from a lot of people i think i hit uh, it was over a hundred countries and no, no vegetarians, not, not, not one. And, you know, no paleo people either, you know, the paleo diet also excludes food categories. So that was simply my observation. And then you get, can, can get into the why of it. You know, what I have found is that, well, you know, it's a couple of things, you know, human beings are, are omnivores naturally. That's what we do. So it's not too surprising that the diet that appears to be optimal for endurance fitness isn't really different from the way we've always eaten, you know, just, you know, an unprocessed version of, of eating everything. So you're going back in time a little bit, you know, and then we can get into the quality thing, but yeah. Yeah. So, and then, you know, uh, recreational endurance athletes, when they do cut out food categories tend to run into trouble. Again, some people, they do okay. But what, what I say is you can succeed as an endurance athlete, eliminating a food group or two, but you're just making it harder for yourself. And why would you do that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Especially in our day and age where, you know, it, it's hard enough to, to fit in all the, all the meals and all the prep and all the, like you said, quality is another one of the core habits. And, you know, that just makes it even more difficult by, you know, adding yet another barrier to make it easy to kind of make, take the easy way out there. So, or to really commit to it and, you know, do well, but then fall off the deep end and kind of lose it. So, you know, I thought that was really helpful. And um, something I wanted you to kind of um, mention is it was a little bit confusing in the book at times, um, but I know that, you know, this is something people will have to purchase the book to really understand, but maybe you could explain. You you came up with a, a diet quality score. Um, I think that was the name of it. Um, yeah. If you could kind of explain what that is and how you kind of came up with that for people to use. Right. So as I often remark, especially when I'm at speaking events, if, if eat everything were the only rule of this diet, like it would be game, game on, but, <laughs> but habit number two, and they're not really rules so much as habits, uh, habit number two kind of qualifies habit number one. So yes, you're allowed to eat everything. In fact, you should eat everything, but your diet should be heavily weighted towards high quality food types. And, and that's, the, again, that was my observation with elite endurance athletes. Yes, mm-hmm. they eat fried food, No, they don't eat very much of it. (laughs) They don't eat it very often. So yeah, you know, diet quality is a a concept that I really try to push because it's it's incredibly important, and it's just not in the public discourse about diet Mm -hmm. and nutrition much. It's all over the scientific literature, and the problem is that people try to come up with shtick for diets, like some kind of theory of healthy eating, and the idea is to find some core characteristic that all quote unquote good foods have in common. It's like an umbrella. Mm -hmm. Like if if a food, you know, all good foods are X and all bad foods are Y. And, you know, we've come up with a bunch of them. You know, the paleo thing is whether it's ancient or newer, but there's also like acidity and alkalinity, probiotic and antibiotic, pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory. People try to find a single, Mm -hmm. you know, unifying concept, but they all fall apart. Like you can always find some examples of foods that just defy that, that attempt at, at uh, you know, sweeping categorization. And, and what uh, nutrition scientists do instead is they, their concept is quality. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and they simply do it by testing what foods do to you. So it's not, it's not any characteristic that foods have. It's just whether if you eat it, you get healthier, or if you eat it, you get less healthy. And, and so it's that's how it's defined. Like mm-hmm. if you eat it and it makes you healthier, obviously they're doing population studies where they're seeing if, they're, if there's a general trend, if you eat more vegetables, does it lower your cancer risk, that type of thing. So when they find those positive outcomes associated with a particular food type, boom, it gets the high quality label. And when they find negative health outcomes associated with a, a particular food type, 
wham, it gets the, the, the low quality label. And that's all it really is. Mm -hmm. So you, you recommended in the book that people kind of um, add up their scores essentially for, to get as much quality in your day as possible while keeping, you know, the other, the other habits in check. And, you know, I thought that was a great way of doing it. And, you know, I know you did kind of address in the book about, um, you know, there are certain things that kind of make it a bit more complicated about like portion size, like does three blueberries count enough to make it a quality food, I guess. But um, I would recommend for people listening to check out the endurance diet, even for that reason alone, if you do feel overwhelmed with all the all the stuff out there and, you know, unsure of just how much you need of what of each thing. And um, I do want to go on to kind of what you're doing now um, in a minute. So there's just a few more things, but I will mention the other two habits are to eat carb centered eat enough and eat individually. So sorry, that was three. But one over over ruling thing that kind of came up in the book was that we need to kind of find what works for us. So there's, you've mentioned this already, there's no quick fix, there's no blanket diet that you must do this. Um, why is that the case? Why can we not kind of model exactly what our friend is doing next to us and kind of uh, do a certain diet? I mean, you talked about this in diet cults, but it kind of came across in right. this too. Yeah, well, there's actually, you know, a variety of reasons. Um, you know, we are all metabolically unique. Mm -hmm. So, you know, none of us, no human being digests and metabolizes and processes food in exactly the same way as, as anyone else. We're all human, obviously. And that's why, you know, the first four habits, they are one size fits all. They're, they're universals. Yeah. They, they establish sort of the, the play space that your mm -hmm. diet needs to occupy if you want to maximize endurance, endurance fitness. But the individuality piece is huge. And again, it's sort of, it's sort of, uh, it sounds like a contradiction to talk about, uh, the universal individuality of elite eating habits, but that was just it. Like mm -hmm. when I went to Spain and sat down with, at a table with 16, uh, professional cyclists, they all got their food from the same chef, but none of them had exactly the same selections on, on their plates. Yeah. And when I talked to them, you know, why are you eating this and not that? They always had a reason. And that's something I found in terms of kind of the surprises with, uh, you know, elite endurance athletes is that they trusted themselves in, in a way that a lot of recreational athletes don't because of their success. Probably mm, it's like, Hey, I must true. know what I'm doing to some degree. So they're, they're okay. kind of going on a little bit of a journey. Like, you know, their coach and their nutritionist will say, okay, you got to eat like this but they don't tell them exactly how to eat. And nor would most of these athletes allow them to, because they find, you know, you know what, I just don't do well with wheat, so I'm not mm -hmm. eating it mm -hmm. or whatever. I'm not sure they would survive long on a Dutch cycling team that, that, that <laughs> I was with <laughs> without eating wheat. But so that kind of thing. So they would, um, you know, they sort of, they, they pay, a, it's a kind of mindfulness. They pay very close attention to cause and effect. It's really kind of usually troubleshooting, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if, you know, everything's fine. You're not going to tweak your diet necessarily, but if you're getting injured a lot, you're getting sick a lot, you're not recovering well, uh, you're having trouble getting down your racing weight, any one of these things, they're going to look for possible dietary causes. And so you just, you conduct little experiments and you know, the sci science hasn't gotten to the point or, or medicine, uh, uh, to the point where it can hold your hand through that entire process. So it does put a little bit of responsibility on you. I also find it kind of liberating, like, you know, yeah. because responsibility is also self-determination. Mm -hmm. Like you get, a, get, you have an opportunity to eat cereal for breakfast every day if, <laughs> if that's what works for you. And, and actually to that point, it's not just the physiological stuff. It's also the psychological stuff, mm. you know, like personal tastes and preferences. These are important too in, in the individ, individual, individuality. I have trouble with that, don't I? <laughs> but you know, you just, you know, because you're going to find your diet more sustainable if you like it. Yes. Or if it's, if it's familiar and comforting, comforting in certain ways. And one thing I noticed over and over with elite endurance athletes with their diet is they almost never start over. And you see recreational endurance athletes just abandon everything yes. they're used to, just uh, throw it all out. You know, I'm going on this person's diet and I'm just going to you know, do it by the book. But usually, it, you know, an elite athlete, what happens is they start, you know, say they start running when they're 11 and they crush everyone because they're super talented. And then they get to high school and they're still crushing everyone, regardless of what they eat, right? Because, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. they're super talented and they work hard. Same thing, maybe all the way through college. And then they turn pro and suddenly they get their butts kicked for the first time in their lives. And of course, at that point, they're going to say, okay, what do I need to do to, yeah. you know, still compete at, at the very highest level? So the, the advantage they have is that their milieu is the best athletes in the world. Their training partners, the people who are beating them 
uh, are right there next mm-hmm. to them. So they can, mm-hmm. they can look over on their plate and see you know, what they're eating that's different. So they don't start over. They just tweak. They just they take what they're doing and change it as little as necessary to make it more like the plate you know, of the person who's who's kicking their butt on the track. Yeah, so true. And I'm so glad you brought that up. And, you know, it is really important to find what works for you. And that's why, you know, whenever I get interviewed, and I'm sure you get the same thing, Matt, where people say, you know, what should you eat before running? And it's like, well, there is no really easy answer there. I mean, can give you suggestions. But at the same time, for me, when I give people suggestions, I say, start with white simple foods because it's probably not going to upset your stomach but then I eat an orange sweet potato with almond butter which is not only not white but it's also nut butter which is fat and protein which is another thing initially people aren't recommended to do but as you said over time you kind of tweak what works for you so take what Matt is saying here and learn to tweak it to your body your digestive system and what other people have kind of um, recommended to you and what you read in this book. And then just one question I had for you. I know we have a lot of listeners who are either working full time or have families and very busy and they say that they're either not hungry um, or they don't have time to eat before they run. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts on this for those kind of people. Like, is it better for them to, you know, sacrifice a few hours of sleep to get up early and kind of get something in? or get a full meal in that they have found works for them? Or is it better to kind of just get something little in? You know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's interesting. When I was in in Kenya researching this book, I I observed, of course, I'd read about this before going that, and they do this really for cultural reasons versus scientific or whatever, but they they run on an empty stomach every day. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're running twice, sometimes three times a day, and it's only their first run of the day that is done on an empty stomach. They may have like a little honey with water before they run. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Ideally, in a perfect world, it's something that you would only do sometimes and it wouldn't mm-hmm. be before every run. You would certainly want to do some runs where you are optimally fueled for them. So I certainly wouldn't sacrifice sleep. But if you're someone who, you know, you, you run once a day and your only opportunity is, is early in the morning, like before work or whatever, by all means, get your sleep, Mm -hmm. (laughs) get the sleep you need and then do what you can. You know, most people can suck down a goo or a little applesauce or something before they get out the door. And then also most people, they're not working every day, right? So you can set aside the weekends as, you know, as kind of sacred days to run in an optimally fueled state, Mm -hmm. state so that you're, you're not, you know, compromising yourself all the time. And maybe even, you know, concentrate your hardest runs on the weekend when you're optimally fueled so that you're only really running easy or or usually just running easy when you are are coming off the overnight fast. So just kind of some practical solutions. Yep. No, that's very helpful. Um, And then finally, last thing about the book. Um, I love that there was a section in there with recipes from countries all over the world. Um, I love that uh, shepherd's pie was the one you picked from Great Britain, which I agree was a pretty good choice. Um, <laughs> but maybe you could share some of the other like interesting things you learned about um, other countries or, um, you know, some of the things that stand out to you, like you mentioned about the Dutch with their wheat or, or yeah, maybe some particular recipes. I mean, Ugali for Kenya is pretty well known, but maybe some other things about other countries you noted. Yeah, so something I didn't necessarily, I, you know, I, I went to Brazil and, um, I was focused, uh, I was focused on like different types of athletes in, in different countries. So in Brazil, it was triathletes. Mm-hmm. And the thing I discovered there, which I kind of, I kind of knew, but I, I didn't really appreciate the extent of it. It's like black beans are the thing there. They're, they're like rice to China. Oh, there, wow. there's like, it's like, yeah, it's like a, like a nationally protected, mm-hmm. you know, food type and mm-hmm. they're everywhere. They just, they, if, like a day without black beans is a day without sunshine for a Brazilian, including. <laughs> and, and, and what's cool is, um, you know, it's part of the reason I think that no one really made the observation before I did in this book that elite endurance athletes all over the world do sort of eat the same way. It's because if you look at the superficial level of specific food choices, they don't eat the same way, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, Canadian cross-country skiers don't eat ugali. Um, they, <laughs> most of them have never heard of it. Um, so, you know, that's not where the similarities are. Uh, what's cool about that is, you know, my shortest description for the endurance diet is a high-quality version of a culturally normal diet. So that's what's cool is that, I mean, wouldn't it be a bummer if, if it was discovered that the optimal diet for endurance fitness was like, I don't know, 
British food. <laughs> so everyone had to eat it. You know what I mean? Like, cause uh-huh. then if you're, if you're from, I'm not knocking British food. I lived in Scotland for a year and I loved it. But, uh, you know, maybe if you know people from South Africa don't want to eat that and it would stink if that was, the, if they had to, in order to perform at the highest level. Well, the good news is you don't, you know, mm-hmm. you sort of, you sort of get to eat in, you know, ways that are you know, culturally familiar or just, you know, culturally preferred for you. And so that, that's kind of fun. So everywhere I went, I found people, you know, the Dutch cyclists, they ate a ton of wheat, you know, and you know, it was, they, they love it and, yeah. and they, they do just fine on it. No, that's kind of cool. Although it's funny you mentioned British food because while I was home last time, you'll, you'll get a kick out of this. I was running along one day and I was like, I really feel like fish and chips, like proper fish and chips. So I went, I said that to my parents and then the next day, my parents and my sister and I got fish and chips. I loved it. I ate the whole thing. It was a giant piece. It was absolutely covered in batter, as you can imagine. I ate a ton of chips, you know, the point where you feel like sick because you've eaten too Mm -hmm. much, which was great, but I enjoyed it. But then that night, I swear, I felt like my insides were on fire. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, okay, that was definitely, I should have had it, but not quite stuffed myself so full because I, I, my insides were just the whole night. It was horrible. So it was worth it because I really enjoyed it. But I think next time I learned my lesson to that my body is not used to that food anymore so <laughs> keeping yes. it keeping it to a minimal amount um so yeah that's the endurance diet um i will put a link in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode two and uh yeah i thought we could move on to some other things but before i do uh you know this is as i've mentioned you've written many books over the years um and for anyone listening i've actually asked you this when we met up in uh california but do you ever run out of topics or things you want to write about, or is this just a never ending list that you keep adding to and never quite get round to all of them? That's my greatest fear is running out of things, uh, that I'm just on fire to write about, but it hasn't happened yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've, I've always got a list. How and many is on that list right now? Roughly. Well, I, I'm working on three books right now <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm, and there are others I would I would like to get to, but we'll we'll just call it three okay. three on the list. Okay, so. that's fair enough. <laughs> and uh, so your latest thing that you are now working on, if you can if you can call it working on, it sounds like a pretty good life to me. Is uh, you you have a new Facebook page, Life Is a Marathon, and you are doing this really cool adventure over this. I think it's eight weeks, so this will be included when this goes live. So maybe tell us a bit about Life Is a Marathon and and what it is. Yeah. So everyone's familiar with that expression, you know, Mm -hmm. life is a marathon and it sounds like sort of maybe uh, an empty platitude, especially to like to non-runners like, yeah, it's a way of saying that life is long or that life can be a struggle sometimes, but there's, there's quite a bit, if you explore that concept, there's quite a bit of depth to it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if you, if you just look at, you know, the marathon as a metaphor for life or almost even as preparation for life in a way, there's a, there's a well-known quote from the great Czech runner, Emil Zatopek. He was the world's greatest runner, world's greatest runner from 1948 to 1952 mm-hmm. or thereabouts. And he, he, he started doing marathons late in his career. And after, after that, he said, if you want to run, run a mile. If you want to experience a different life, mm-hmm. run a marathon. Yeah. And it's so true. If you look at you know, the examples, we've all heard of the examples of just the, the transformative power that that the marathon experience has for people. I mean, people overcome drug abuse or substance abuse through running a marathon, setting, setting, achieving that goal or, or, you know, overcome childhood trauma, or they may, you know, it may just be the the leverage they need to just break out of a life that's just mundane and boring to them. They, they may, you know, it may inspire them to make like a midlife career change or something. Or I talked to one woman, it got her, she decided to get divorced after she, (laughs) she, but I mean, but it was, it was a good good decision for for, for her husband and and her family. So people, they, they discover themselves and it really does it in a way that nothing else does. And you can look around. I mean, you know, uh, religion and spirituality can be powerful for a lot of people, but you know, we've all known people who go to church religiously, so to speak for, for years and they don't get any wiser. They, they don't grow. So, I mean, the opportunity is there, but, but not everyone necessarily, you know, seizes it. Whereas you can't run a marathon without it changing you. <laughs> it's just, it's going, it's going to happen. So I really wanted to explore that. Uh, cause I think it's just, it's almost magical in a way. Um, and so many people can relate to it. So I wanted to write a book that 
sort of like delved into it kind of philosophically, but, but brought a lot of these stories together. Um, and I wanted to go on a journey to, it's really in a way, sort of a celebration of, of the richness of running mm -hmm. and taking a, a, a deep look at what it is that running does for the people it does the most for. Um, so that's what life as a marathon is all about. I haven't gotten into what I'm actually doing right now at all, but maybe that's your next question. I don't know. It, it will be in a second, but before I go on, um, you did write a post on that Facebook page, which I'll put a link in the show notes to about running marathons for people and how powerful that is and you know how it can help with things like mental illness. So maybe you could kind of just explain a little bit about your thoughts on that first. Yeah. So, you know, something that I'm, I'm tying into this, this whole project and the book that will come out of it is my experience. You know, I, I, I wouldn't be, this wouldn't be so personal to me if I hadn't had an experience like that myself. So my wife, Nataki developed bipolar disorder when, after we'd been together for a while and anyone who's had, who's been touched by mental illness, it's a hard road. It's just, mm -hmm. it's a tough experience for not only the person who has it, but for, especially if, if they're married, their spouse, you go through it together. And it's just one of those things that makes life a marathon. You know, it is life is a marathon for everyone in some way. But for me and my wife, that's been the, the greatest trial of our lives. And this could sound like trivializing to people who haven't had similar, similar experiences. But after going through what we've gone through, I'm sure glad I'm a runner. Mm -hmm. uh, because I just, you know, I, my soul has been tested just, you know, in my non-running life. And I feel like just the inurement to suffering, the, just the ability to just get up, dust myself off and continue that I gained through, I'm simply not the same person I was, you know, before I ran my first marathon. So it changed me and it, it strengthened me. It, it, it made me better able to handle whatever, you know, hitting the wall is bad, but you know, the, the worst things that happen in life outside of running are a lot worse. Yeah. And it's just nice to be, you know, prepared a little bit for those types of things. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm sort of telling my story and it's really also Nataki's story as part of this, but there are so many others that are, you know, they're, they're different, but they're the same. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's really kind of the, you know, the theme. And do you think there's, there's another reason why it's so powerful for, for people to like be training for something greater than themselves? Like let's say it was someone's first time marathon and they, they're doing this for someone else. Why do you think that's so, you know, meaningful to people? You know, I, I think it's because we are social creatures mm -hmm. and most of us can say we would give our lives for at least one other person. Yeah. And so, you know, that's what love is. Love is putting the needs and well being of other people ahead of your own. And it's just it's just a natural thing. So nothing can motivate you more than the people you love the most, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you, if you're doing something entirely for yourself and you're sort of a normal person, you, you really can't be as motivated mm -hmm. as, as you, as you could be if you're, if you're, if it's for, for a cause that's greater than you, that's where, that's why you find even with, you know, the, the greatest runners in the world who are, you know, competing for money and glory and fame, you know, all very sort of self-centered things, even they they, they never try harder. They never dig deeper. They never give more of themselves when they are also competing for their country or their team or, you know, something that's, that's just beyond themselves. Yeah. And it's cool. You know, it's yeah. like, that's one of the things that like makes me like my species. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's always a good sign. And, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'm I'm wondering what the other things are that make you um, not like our species now, but uh, we'll save that for another day. <laughs> um, so you did talk about, you know, uh, the social aspect there. And maybe this is where you could explain what you are doing with the eight marathons in eight weeks. And you've been meeting people all over the all over the US and kind of tell us a bit about what you're doing and how you're meeting new people along the way. Yeah. So actually I, um, I stole some inspiration, you know, so I had an idea and then it's like, okay, how do I execute it? Like, you know, cause you could take it in a million different directions. And I, I drew inspiration from, of all people, Hunter S. Thompson, the, the late great gonzo journalist who mm -hmm. wrote uh, fear and loathing in Las Vegas. So people may forget if they've only seen the movie or they, it's been a while since they read the book, but that whole journey that he took, you know, to the road trip to Vegas, that, drug soaked, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, pilgrimage. Um, the, the conceit was that he was going in search of the American dream. He was just gonna, because like Ve Vegas is just so it's like this distillation of America. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so he was, you know, that was, it was an artifice, but that's what he was doing, going in search of the American dream. So I wanted to, to conduct a physical journey in search of the magic of the marathon, basically. Um, so I just wanted to, I already had my own story to tell that was sort of in the past, but I didn't, I didn't, I wanted to, I wanted it to be more than that. So I just came up with the idea of, um, just traveling across the United States, running marathons myself and, and a great variety of different marathons. And then, yeah, meeting as many other runners as, as I possibly could and, you know, interacting with them and getting their stories and just tying it all up in, in a ball. Mm -hmm. And you've been running with elite runners along this process. So maybe you could explain or share a few things you've kind of learned. Maybe you didn't expect running with other elite runners along the way. Yeah, well, um, you know, I, in, uh, in, in the post that you're probably referring to, I, I confess to being, uh, uh, what they call a jock sniffer, which is just <laughs> someone who, uh, there's also the term speed goggles, but it's just when you, <laughs> when you look up, when you look up to the people who are the best at, at something you're passionate about, it's, yeah. you know, I, you can just describe it as shallow or whatever, but I just, I dig it. I, I, I really like interacting with the top runners in the world, because they, they tend to be, it's not just that they're super talented. They tend to be really interesting people mm -hmm. because, you know, you know, cause so much the mind plays such a huge role in achieving success in, in something so difficult. So you find people who just are maybe a little quirky and, but they've, they've got their, you know, their own personality and they're, and they're strong. So it's just a blast. So, um, when I was in Flagstaff, I got a chance to do a little running with the members of Team Northern Arizona Elite. Mm -hmm. Their their marquee eight runner is uh, Matt Lano. A lot of people know that that name. Yep, uh, sixty one minute half marathoner. Um, I actually get my Nataki and I got to stay with him. We we slept at his house. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, um, that night, and then a couple of days later, it might have been the very next day. As a matter of fact, uh, we showed up in. Um, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I just put a shout out or a call out rather on social media, looking for someone to run with the next day. The person I ended up running the next day with was Carolyn Rotich, the 2015 Boston Marathon winner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was a case of be, be careful what you ask for because everything was wrong about it. Like I, it only got set up late at night. I was drinking my second beer of the evening and uh, Ryan Bolton, who's uh, Carolyn's coach, uh, he was like the liaison who set it up he gave me the specifics and it was, the drive was too far. She was going to be running too fast for me. It was the day before I was supposed to run my second marathon. So just all the specifics were wrong. And my immediate response was, hell yeah, I'm in. <laughs> so that was, that was a cool experience. And did you manage to keep up with her? Yeah. So it, it worked out pretty well, actually. She was doing, she's running Boston again yeah. this year and she was doing, um, a four loop, 24 mile run, but on a six mile loop. Mm. And she was doing the first one slow for her. And then she was winding it up all the way through mm -hmm, the end. Mm -hmm. So I was, I ran, of course, the first loop with her, but it's still, it's at 6,000 feet. And this is a 223 marathon. Yeah, so yeah, slow yeah. For her. <laughs> so I, I, I did okay. I, you know, cause I'm, I'm sort of peppering her with questions as much as I can the whole way. And when we started to go up some of the gnarlier Hills, I had to shut up. Uh, <laughs> but uh, otherwise, yeah, I didn't Still do a too cool bad. Experience. So then yeah. you, how many marathons, uh, so you, you've done eight, um, as of this recording, you've done two, but maybe yes. you could tell us, uh, where the locations are so that people can kind of follow along with you in the future. Yeah. So I, I started in Modesto, my hometown marathon, Modesto, California, um, last weekend, it was the Dust Bowl Marathon yeah, in eastern New Mexico. Next up is the Rock and K. I had to pick some obscure events to sort of get the dates, <laughs> geography to line oh, up. But it's okay. good. good. Can't all be you know, New yeah, York yeah. or whatever. Uh, so the Rock and K Trail Marathon in uh, just a beautiful state park in, in Kansas. Then I go uh, east from there to uh, Reston, Virginia for the Runner's Marathon of Reston. Mm -hmm. That'll be a lot easier, I think. Roads, flatter. Um, and then it's the Boston marathon. So I've got, yeah, I've got the antipodes covered. There's like the dust bowl marathon <laughs> where like when I mentioned I was running Boston, they, they were astonished. It was like that anyone they knew could even oh, call. Oh, wow. Boston. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So going from there to Boston itself, where obviously everyone qualified. And is Boston um, the last one? No, that's number five. five? Uh, so from there I start heading back West. I do the, uh, glass city marathon in Toledo, Ohio another one in, 
uh, the, called the jailbreak marathon in, in middle of nowhere in Wisconsin. And then finally the Eugene marathon. Mm -hmm. Wow. That would be early. cool. Yeah. yeah. Great. And, um, you know, as you've mentioned, you've met, you know, lots of people along the way and you've kind of talked about how great it is to, you know, run with other people, but for someone who is listening and thinking, Oh, you know, I'd love to travel and meet new people and run with new people, but I'm not Matt's, Matt Fitzgerald with, you know, hundreds of thousands of fans everywhere. So what would you, what would be your advice for someone who is interested in maybe running with others or meeting other runners, but not really sure whether it's worth it or how they would go about it? Yeah. You know, this is really a lifestyle for a lot of people that that Dust Bowl race I went to was just, it was dominated by serial marathoners. It's like, you know, sort of a subculture now within, <laughs> run, within running. It was actually, I, I came in on day five of a five day, five state, five marathon series. Wow. And I was one of the few who was only running one of them. And most of these people, yeah, a lot of retirees do it. It's almost like, like an alternative to going to the casino every weekend mm -hmm. for people who mm -hmm. want to keep fit in their golden years. But I found that a lot of people do, they do this sort of travel. I mean, it's a thing now. There's like the bit, the whole 50 state club yeah, where people yeah. are trying to do, and not all of these people are independently wealthy, you know? So, and that's why the guy who created, for example, this Dust Bowl series, he did it specifically to make this sort of experience more possible for, for people. Because, you know, in the bad old days, every, every marathon was on a weekend, well, these weren't, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know what I mean? So, and I met a guy there, a 75 year old guy who's run more than 1600 marathons. Wow. And he just, he just travels around with his girlfriend, uh, in a camper and they, they, they just, they spend the night in Walmart parking lots the, <laughs> the day before each marathon. And so, you know, you don't have to be sort of a, a celebrity in the running community or, uh, have, you know, millions of dollars saved in the bank to do this kind of thing. You have to be, you have to be, be tolerant of, of some risk. I'm, I'm taking a risk, but I don't have a publishing contract for the book I'm writing. So I, even I'm taking a risk by doing, it, but that's part of it, mm -hmm. you know? So you have to be just sort of will be willing to take a leap, but also you can sort of take cues from the people who are already doing this. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of learning as I go that how, how doable this really is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how is your body handling all that, that side of things as well? Like the traveling and obviously the racing and the running. Yeah. So, you know, I, I am just brittle by, by nature. I, I, I break down pretty easily, but I'm, I'm feeling good. You know, I've, I've been at this long enough that I've learned a lot about how to keep myself together. I think I prepared well for this too, where I went into it just a little bit under trained on purpose so that I could actually improve or get, get mm -hmm. bitter and stronger uh, in, in the early weeks and maybe just be hanging on by the end of it <sighs> versus like being absolutely sharp at the beginning and mm -hmm. overcooking myself halfway yeah. through. I think that that was the right decision. So, so far, so good. You know, I'm, I'm always sore and it changes. It seems to like rotate. Like I never know what I'm going to get when I just <laughs> do a, a shakeout run, you know, the day after a, a marathon, it's like something new hurts and something that hurt yesterday doesn't anymore. But, uh, like yeah, I'm holding up a game of, uh, a game of chance with what, what's going to hurt when you take that first step out of the bed in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so have you been, uh, utilizing your well-known 80, 20 rule? Uh, no, I'm, I'm on the 100 zero plan right now. <laughs> Actually today I'm, I'm very excited because later today I'm just, I'm going to open up the throttle a little bit, but I, I was dinged up throughout the training for the, for this. I had, you know, just some issues the thing was, I normally don't run every day. Mm -hmm. When I'm at home, I do a lot. I rely on cross training and run three or four times a week. In anticipation of this adventure, I experimented with going back to running daily, just because I, you know, I I correctly anticipated that it would be hard to, you know, always find a gym I could pop into to hop on a bike or whatever. So I wanted to see. I wanted to give that a go, and it was a disaster. You know, I just, I just, I passed a tipping point, and then you know, it was just I had to scramble just to be able to run, mm -hmm. <laughs> let alone run eight, eight marathons. So it, when, whenever I get into a situation like that, all of the high intensity stuff just goes out the window. And so for a long time now, I've been able to sort of run as much as I want, but there's almost like a governor on me. If I, if I run slower than seven and a half minutes per mile, I'm okay. If I go 729 or faster, like something starts to shred. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so, yeah. you, so you, when you say that you're just doing, you're doing the races and then everything else is slow. Is that what you mean? That's okay. right. And, okay. and I'm not racing the races I, either. I'm just, you know, okay. if the last one I did, I, I walked a couple miles at a couple different points so that I could interview 
people like this 1600 marathon guy oh, who okay. he was walk he was walking. So if I wanted to interview him, I was going to walk. Okay, I see. Okay. Yep. And then just in, you know, uh, when I say about the 80-20 rule, I will put a link in the show notes to uh, Matt's book and then also uh, an article you can read about the 80-20 rule, which is, you know, keeping 80% of your volume easy, 20% hard. Um, but just in general, are you, do you tend to be an effort-based runner or are you one of the pace kind of uh, Garmin watcher people? I'm effort-based for the 80 and pace-based for the 20, pretty okay. much. That's a good That's way the breakdown. Right. And then yeah. one other thing I wanted to ask you about before we get on to the uh, Running For Real 4 is I met you, as I mentioned earlier, um, in person the day before uh, we both ran California International Marathon. And I hope you won't mind me saying this, but I specifically remember I said, oh, what are you going for tomorrow? And you said, oh, well, I should be able to run a sub 250 I think it was uh with my eyes closed but you never know with running and I was like well yeah but surely at your point at your stage you you know what you're gonna do and you were like no well you never know and then sure enough the next day you you did struggle so I thought maybe you could kind of just say to our listeners who maybe aren't as experienced as you or maybe are a bit unsure and wondering if they're the only one who struggles kind of how running humbles you and how that's okay it's part of your journey yeah, well, that that is the marathon for you, and it's part of the, the whole mystique of it, and, mm -hmm. and part of what makes it worth going on this kind of journey to explore is that you never completely conquer it, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter who you are. I mean, you know, some of the greatest names in the history of our sport have been humbled and embarrassed. You know, the Haile Gibber Selassie has been yeah. humbled and embarrassed by by the the marathon. So yeah, you're in good company if you if you have a a bad race. I was talking uh, with Carolyn Rotich about this as well. And, you know, she, she said, you can't run 10 marathons and expect the 11th to be easy. You can, you can expect it to be better. And by better, she meant just, you have a lot of, uh, you know, acquired wisdom to apply. Uh, you can make better decisions, but you, you're not in control mm -hmm. entirely when it comes to the marathon. And that, that is part of the beauty of it is that, you know, it's, you're, you're taking a chance every time out. Yep. So true. And I'm sure, well, if you, if you haven't been there yet with the marathon, then, uh, you better prepare yourself because it's probably coming. But I, th I think most of us who have done a few marathons have been through that one where it just, you think, you know, how it's going to go and it just never does. So yeah, great advice there. All right. So we are going to go on to the running for real four, starting with, this is going to be an interesting one, a unique nutrition tip from you, Matt. Yeah, I'm not sure I can call it a tip, but it's something. It's something I do, I've, I've begun to do. And that mm -hmm. is actually my, my go-to pre-marathon breakfast now is 80% fat and, and about, and, and sort of, it's like a high fat, uh, moderate, lowish carb breakfast. I was turned on to it by this study that was done by Japanese researchers who pointed out that when you wake up the morning of a marathon and you've, you've trained and tapered properly and your diet has been appropriate up to that point, it takes very little carbohydrate to sort of top off, you know, you deplete a little bit overnight, mm -hmm. but you don't have to eat much carbohydrate that morning to sort of top off your supplies. On the other hand, it's pretty well known that if you have a single high fat meal and you exercise after it, your muscles will, will rely more on fat as fuel than they would otherwise. So they just tested sort of a traditional high carb, low fat pre-endurance test breakfast against, uh, you know, a high fat, moderate carb uh, one. And, uh, people perform better on the high fat, moderate carb mm. breakfast. It was not, you know, people tend to turn, make things black and white. It wasn't fat versus carbohydrate. Yeah. They were just looking for something more better and more nuanced. And, and the high fat one even included like a shot of carbs on the start line pretty much. So they were just saying, you know, can we, can we take this to the next level? And, you know, I tested it out myself and, uh, you know, you can't tell if you're getting a 0.5% difference, mm -hmm. you know, but I'll take it. So, yeah. you know, you sort of, if you, if you trust the research and then you don't end up throwing up three miles into the marathon after, after having, you know, a sausage, egg and cheese breakfast sandwich, then, so that I've been doing it ever so since. So that, that is what you have, sausage, egg and cheese sandwich? Yeah. And to get the, the macronutrients right, I actually double up on the egg okay. often. So yeah. two eggs, a sausage and a, and a bread or cheese, muffin. Cheese, yeah, cheese and a, and, and a biscuit. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's an interesting one. I'll see if anyone else tries it. Although I will say that I do actually most mornings, um, I usually do have mostly fat for breakfast and, uh, I, I find that that works the best for me as well. So I have to agree. I don't do that race morning, although I guess almond butter does have some fat, but 
yeah, I, I definitely agree with you that it does. I, I find it's one of the best ways too. Okay, um, what about a running for real moment? A moment either, uh, you know, a, a low moment, an embarrassing moment, uh, a moment where you kind of realized, you know, this is how running running is. So I actually have a rich personal history of either missing the start of races <laughs> or getting lost and failing to finish them for that reason. <laughs> I actually have a number I could choose from here, uh, but... Uh, the one I'll give you is, uh, my first ultra marathon was the American river 50, 50 mile race and it's 50 miles, right? I got lost 49 miles into it. Oh, no. <laughs> ended up, ended up finding the finish line from the wrong direction. And, uh, so how yeah. many did it end up being? I ended up going like an extra 1.3. Okay. Like That's that. not too bad. And I actually, I, I got into an argument with the race director because I, I actually, when you get, when you go off course, you're, you know, technically you're supposed to go back to the point where you, it doesn't matter if you went extra, if you didn't yeah. cover the whole course, yeah. those are the rules. So I turned myself in and said, I'm, I'm DQ'd. And she's like, you gotta be kidding me. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not DQing you. So we're going back and forth, having the opposite of what the normal, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, that's very you. honorable of you so shows <laughs> shows how good of a person you are all right she and won then, the argument by the way i i am oh. in the official result <laughs> well that's good i think that's good overall and what about a high moment and why it meant so much to you so um the high moment for me was last year's boston marathon so the boston marathon is in, in my blood it's the reason i became a runner i i ran the last mile of it in 1983 with my dad it was his first marathon. He was a bandit. That's how he was in Boston as his first marathon. And that's what it was just, it was an incredible experience. It made me want to be a runner. And I, I've just have, I've, so I, but Boston has been a big part of my life ever since. And, but I didn't get around to running it myself until 2009. And I had a disastrous experience. I was in the best shape of my life. I just PR'd in the half marathon. I was cocky, ready to go. And I'm not a good downhill runner and I just got humbled by it. Mm -hmm. And then last year I got a chance finally to, to go back. So it's, you know, six year gap and I, I had learned some things and I, I had a, I had a great race. I had a, a much better race in, in kind of tough conditions. It was, you mm -hmm. know, 70 degrees that day. And so I felt like I, I had mastered a race that the race that meant more to me than any other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I was people, you should see the photos from after that race. I just, I got <laughs> a grin from ear to ear. Oh, uh, that's how it should be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then finally, what do you tell yourself when you're standing on the start line? Yeah, I thought that was an interesting question because, you know, when, when I reflected on it, I realized I don't tell myself anything. I, I really sort of empty my mind in, in that moment. And I just find myself just absorbing what's going on. You know, you've got your national anthem, you've got nervous runners shaking their legs around you. And I'm just sort of just feeling it. It's a little bit, cause I'm, it's funny because I'm not normally that guy. I'm usually plenty of chatter in my head, but that is a moment where it just, everything kind of just hmm. empties out for me. And, and the talking starts when the suffering starts yep, later. Down yep, the road. yep. Yep. Well, <laughs> if uh, it obviously works for you, well, most of the time. So, um, right. so keep it up, I guess. And then finally, I have been asking my guests to, um, show us their power pose. So Matt, will you, would you be interested in using the hashtag R for R power pose and showing us use either what you would stand on the start line or just some way that you would show us a power pose? Will you be, are you interested in that? Oh, of course, I'm okay, all over it. Cool. I will send you more details. Uh, well, Matt, thank you so much for um, the chat today. Uh, what would you would like to say to people who want to keep up to date with you? Where, where's the best place to find you? Yeah, um, uh, my website is is the place to start, mattfitzgerald.org. But if you want to specifically follow what I'm doing now, uh, it's Facebook. Um, my sponsor is Highlands. So it's Facebook uh, slash Highlands Life is a Marathon. All kind of run together there. Mm -hmm. And I will put links in the show notes so um, you can check those out. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it and uh, look forward to another one of these soon. Thank you, Tina. First episode complete, a relatively few hiccups. There was a few jumps in the uh, connection there, but otherwise not too bad. I'm pretty happy with that one. Matt made it nice and easy for me though, so I should prepare myself that some guests will not be quite as easy to interview as he was. If you did enjoy today's episode, I'm asking you, will you please share it with your friends and family, Facebook groups, your running groups, or whoever you think would enjoy it. I know there's no ads right now and I know I'm kind of asking you to do this, but it'd be so helpful as I'm flying solo now and it would just mean the world to me if you could either share it 
or leave a review on iTunes, which would be even more helpful. And you can do so by going to tinamuir.com. That's T-I-N-A-M-U-I-R.com forward slash iTunes. I will explain exactly how to leave a review because let's face it, they have not made it very easy for us, have they? So I have four episodes that are released today. If you are listening to this on April 14th, 2017, the other two are James Dunn of Kinetic Revolution, who's going to talk about strength and mobility so we can all stay injury free. And Sindra Kampoff is going to talk about the mental toughness aspect and how we can strengthen our mental muscles. So those are two really great ones. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the first episode is actually just an intro to who I am and just a bit of me kind of explaining my backstory. So if you don't have to listen to that one, I completely understand if you want to just go on. But I hope you have enjoyed these episodes and this one in particular. I hope you have a great week of training and I will see you again next Friday. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information. 